Today's sermon is called, Look Out for the Good. Are you looking out for the good? Always? You know what? For so many of us, we don't. And you know what it is? Our, our human nature not to, right? Or I should say our fallen nature not to. I mean, this week has been absolutely crazy. If you've been watching the news, there was a horrible plane crash in the French Alps. And you know what? That, that's, it's horrible on its own and everybody perished. And what's coming out, you know, learning what's actually happened and how it went down is even probably even worse and hard for a lot of people to swallow. But don't you notice that when something bad happens here outside of you or within your circle, how we just come so consumed with that badness and we just start playing that what if mentality, right? What if we didn't do that? Or what if they changed this? What if this? And you know what? We get so caught in the what ifs and we just start seeing the bad that we just come consumed from it. Don't actually see the good that comes out. Okay? I know that kind of sounds strange. Everything, but we're going to take a look at it because I post that question says, are you still upset with Adam's choice of making the wrong choice of the tree, right? Because you know what, what happens as we're always complaining about stuff that we see on TV and we start to complain, we're actually saying, Adam, why didn't you eat from the right tree in return? That's what we're saying. Adam, why didn't you do that? So let's go to the garden, if we may say, right? Let's go to Genesis 2 and verse 7. It says, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of breath or spirit life, and he became a living being or a living soul, right? Adam became living. He was just dirt. God had to breathe, and then he became living, right? And the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to, to the sight or to be desire. Notice that he grew everything. He called it good. It's good in God's eyes, right? Maybe we start to look at that. Everything God sees is good. Good. For food, the tree of life also in the center of the garden. I want you, if you have your Bibles, you, you like to underline, underline that. Because we're going to come back to that. It's in the center, the tree of life, a.k.a. Jesus. Okay? He's in the center. In the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil, blessed and calamity. God also saw that tree to be good too. In his eyes, it is good. Okay? But it's not good for man. It's lost. So we go down to verse 16. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden. Notice, take your Bible, and if you want to, underline freely eat. Because we're going to come back to that portion too. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and blessing and claiming, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die, right? So this was God's rules and commands and stuff like that, okay? So, let's go to Genesis 3. So God had made man, he breathed into him, he became a living soul, or leaving a living being, depends on how you want to see it. But soul means living being, right? Place him in God, he made all the, everything in there, and he told Adam, you can eat freely of it. He placed the tree of life in the midst, and he <laughs> placed also the knowledge of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He says you can you shouldn't eat from that. Okay? He's guiding it out, but Adam still has a free choice, right? So let's go to Genesis 3. Now man, God saw fit that he should not be alone, put man to sleep, and out of his rib he brought out woman, right? And married them together. So God performed the first marriage. So now now the serpent was more subtle and crafty than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made, and he, Satan, so the serpent is Satan, he's controlling this name, said to him, can it really be that God has said, you should not eat from every tree of the garden? Notice he left out the word freely eat, okay? There's truth, but it's mixed in with lies, so it actually becomes a lie, right? That's how we always get tricked, right? Notice the woman's response. I love this. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees of the garden. Now, did God say that? No. He said, you may freely eat, meaning that God is gracious and he is love, right? But she didn't see that, okay? So, the devil's got it right where he wants her. He now, she is now believing that lie, that free, and it's not freely. Now, she keeps going. Now, I want you to notice one thing. God had spoke this to Adam. He told Adam the commandment. He didn't ever tell Eve, right? Now, in the Hebrew, Adam is sitting right next to Eve at this whole conversation going. He is standing right there, but he is quiet. Men, 
you need to speak to your wives. Okay? I, maybe this is where they get that saying, says the teacher's always quiet during the test. Well, you know what? In Ephesians 5, it says, that, it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, that, so that he gave his life for it, that he wars her with his word. So Jesus is always speaking to you. So the teacher's not always quiet. He's always speaking to you, commanding you, teaching you, and telling you the right choice to make, right? So Adam is standing right there, and he's quiet. He's not even telling her, hey, hey, it's freely eat. Oh, 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 in this next part. Except from the tree, fruit from the tree, which is in the middle of the garden. Tree of the knowledge. Ah. She goes, you shall not eat, neither shall you touch it unless you die. God placed what tree in the middle of the garden? Tree of life. She saw the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because she didn't see God as gracious anymore. She saw the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden. Her mind was still... It was in the midst. But God had, but in the midst of God was the tree of life. Devil has got it right where she wants it. Okay? He's like, good. Now I, got her. Now I can twist her all up, right? She's already done for. I'm going to get her to eat from it. But the servant said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil and blessing and calamity. And now he's tricking her. God, God would teach him that. But he says, you will be like God. He's holding back to you because he doesn't want you to be like him. Well, if God made man in his own image, then he is like God in a sense, right? And the woman saw the tree was good now for food, and that it was likely, and took it, it took, at, looked at it, and tree to be desired in order to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some also to her husband, and he ate. That's where it says she was right next, he was right next to the whole time. He was silent. Adam was silent. Come on, Adam. God spoke to you, and you're supposed to water your wife with his word. Right? He did. So, gentlemen, get married, water your wife with the word of God. Okay? With the gospel. So, if we go down. So, they, they sin, they fall, and God has now approached them and tell them, okay, this is all that's going to happen to you. Right? It, it's dreadful, right? Now, look. Now, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to know and how to distinguish between good and evil and blessing and claiming. And now, let he, lest he put forth his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat, live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to the ground from which he was taken. So God drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden the cherubim and a flaming sword, which he turned every way to keep and guard the way of the tree of life. They were kicked out of the garden now. Because they fell, right? They couldn't touch the tree of life. If you don't know, they said they realized that they were naked. It means God's glory, his countenance, heavy word, his good opinion of them was now gone. They can no longer eat of the tree of life, right? So God had to drive them out. God's holy and righteous, and he cannot have sin and holiness together, right? So he had to drive them out. It gets worse, you ready? Genesis 5. This book of generations of the offspring of Adam, when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. So when God created Adam, he made him in God's likeness, right? In his own likeness. So, and in the Hebrew is Elohim. We made him in, in our image, which means what? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He created them male and female and blessed them and named them both Adam and man. And at, the, and at that time, they were created. Adam means what? It means, the, means man, which means mankind. He got that name he had. When Adam had lived 130 years old, he had a son in his own likeness. I want you to recollect that. He even had his, he had his son, Seth, in his own likeness. It was not no longer in God's likeness. Okay? He was made in, that, in God's likeness. But because he fell, now all his seed is in his likeness. So, we see that Adam picked the wrong tree. He did talk to his wife. He let his wife freestyle on her own, no offense, but she didn't know. It was up to man to do it. So we just blame him because he didn't point to her and say, it's, it's her fault. God says, no, it's your fault. You're the leader. You should lead her. Okay? You need to lead your wife. He made the wrong choice. He ate from the wrong tree. What makes it even worse, he had all this sin come upon him. What's even worse that you and I, when we were born from our mother's womb, 
We are made into Adam's likeness, not God's image. We're made in Adam's image now, which is what? Sin. Because if you read Romans 5, it talks about it. It says, for as one offense, he made all sinners. All means all, right? His offense made them all sinners. You're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. Okay? This sounds so horrible. When we look at Adam and say, Adam, why didn't you just pick the tree of life to eat from? Why didn't you do this? Look at what you've done to me. It sounds unfair, right? Did you have a choice to be born from your mother's womb? No. It naturally is we say, you know what, Adam? You did me wrong. And you look at the world and you see all the destruction. You're like, Adam, you did me wrong. Adam, why didn't you just eat from that tree of life? You could eat the tree of life and live forever. We wouldn't have all this calamity, right? We would just live peacefully. You know what? Y'all run track. Y'all probably wouldn't be able to run track mostly, like, right? We'd be running around the garden, right? <laughs> right? I like to run track, too. Y'all run seven miles three times a week. So. Who's, who's long distance running there here? Uh, so how, how long, man? How long? How far can you? Really? Awesome. Who else raised their hand? How long? You, how far are you running, man? Like six. What's up, man? That's my man right there. I can sprint well too. I play baseball too as well. So, may not be able to do all that, right? And we look at this and we're like, man, this is just horrible. This is absolutely horrible for you and I, right? I want to show you something that's amazingly good. I want you to look out for the good. Because I, I want to show you something that God, if we were, if we were left in God, we may not have never experienced. You ready for that? Let's go, let's go further down to Genesis. Let's go to Genesis 22. Let's look at Abraham. I love Abraham. And at this point, he had already had his promised child, Isaac. He had already been winged. He had kicked out Ishmael, right? Kicked them out. So it's just Adam, it's just Abraham, Isaac, and Sarah, right? His promised child he'd been waiting for all these years, right? Here he is. Now, let's pick up where God is, or Genesis 22, verse 1. It says, after these events, God tested and proved Abraham. Now we're like, well, God tests us, don't we? Actually, he was trying to, sh this word in Hebrew means he wanted to show Abraham something amazing, right? It's so much deeper than where our English words can ever put out. But he wanted to show Adam something about himself. Okay? He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. God, God said, take now your son, your only son. I love this. Only son. He had two sons. Ishmael. God didn't see Ishmael. Ishmael was born out of his own self-effort. Isaac was born out of grace. Okay? So he only said, your only son Isaac. That's it. Just son Isaac. Whom you love knows that. Whom you love. He didn't say that about Ishmael. I think that's amazing. And go to the region of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering upon the one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Mount Moriah is in Jerusalem. Okay, just to give you an idea, give you a placement. It's in Jerusalem. Okay, it's a part of Jerusalem. So Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac, and he split the wood of the burnt offering, and then began began the trip to the place of which Yah had told him. Say so he wanted this trip. Let's get down to verse 6. Then Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on the shoulders of Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his own hand, fire pot, a knife, and the two of them went on together. And Isaac said to Abraham, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, See, here are the fire and the wood, but where is the land for the burnt sacrifice, right? Abraham said, my son, God himself will provide a lamb for a burnt offering. So the two went on together. And when they came to the place which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there, and then he laid the wood in the order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar of the wood. Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took hold of the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called from, to him from heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham, he answered, here I am. And he said, don't lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you love God. And since you have not held back from me or begrudged you, giving me your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and glanced around, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his thorn. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering and as a sending sacrifice to his son. I want to tell you right now, this is actually a picture of what God did for you and I. Abraham, being the father, took his son, 
son, Jesus, placed the wood on his back, which is what? A picture of what? The cross. And they went up the hill, Mount Calvary, right? The fire pot, which is what? Represent of what? God's wrath. The knife, which means what? The death stroke, right? They went up, present sacrifice, right? Well, God didn't want man to make sacrifice, right? So he made Abraham stop. So he said, Abraham, turn around. I know that you love me. How? How did God know that Abraham loved him? By giving up his only son, right? So God says, I'm going to show you something, what I'm going to do. I must show you that I love you by giving up my only son. Now, we keep going here because Abraham turned around, turned around, and saw a mature ram caught in a thicket. When, if you're at Mount Moriah and you turn around, you see a higher mount called Mount Calvary. And on there is the ram caught in the thicket, which is what? Jesus Christ caught with the, thorn, with the crown of thorns on his head. And this is where, when they, the Pharisees said, how, how did Abraham see? He was Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw Jesus Christ on the cross, caught in the thicket. That's who it was. But God placed this. I want to present to you now that we, if we have had eat of the tree, we would never understood God's love for us. Because by man's fall, God proved his love to us by doing what? Giving up his only son. Because if you go down to 1 John 4, it says, He who does not love has not become acquainted with God. Does not, not, and never did know God, for God is love. In this love of God was made manifest of where we are concerned. In that God sent his son, the only begotten and unique son, into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. But God said, this is what love is. Not that we love God. <clears throat> not that we love him. That's cool and all to love him. But he says, that's not what's important here. But that he loved us. And sent his son to be the perpetuation or mercy seat for our sins. You never know that somebody truly loves you until you're at your worst state. And they say, I still love you. That's how you know somebody loves you. Because that's called unconditional or agape love. I can, I can tell you all the many years I tried to date a woman. I always held back who I was. Do we not? Do we try, we try to, when we go on a date, do we not try to hold back who we are? Why? Because we, if we're scared, we're scared, if they find out who we truly are and all of our faults, that they'll just walk away. Are we not? Be real. In the first time in my life, after 14 plus years of dating women, getting sex from them, and having my pleasure and having my fun with them, I was at my breaking point. Actually, I was getting ready to commit suicide. And this woman came up, my wife, and I said, hey, this is who I am. I, for one, I didn't put my wall up. I said, this is who I am. And she says, I love you. And I kept her. Because she loved me for who I was, not for the persona, it's just perfect person that I am. She loved me for all my faults. You know, what's funny is through her, I saw Jesus Christ. And God says, I love you. And I was at my worst. He says, yeah, I love you. That's how we know that God actually truly loves us. So we, if we look at the fall of man, we don't have to sit there and just grovel inside the dirt, the fallenness of it, and just keep playing about, Adam, why didn't you eat a tree? Like, thank you, Adam. Because you know what? I get to see your love for me, God. I get to see it on display because it hung on the cross for me. Because if you keep going, I got tons of scripture here. I like to preach. I like to talk. Ask my wife because I preach to her seven days a week. Most of these people here only to hear me one day. She gets to hear me all the rest of the day. And that, hence why this sermon came about. Go to Ephesians 2. In you, he made alive where you were dead, dead by your sin, your trespasses and sin. Paul's getting ready to tell us, you were a horrible person. 
right? In which at one time you walked habitually, you were following the course and the fashion of this world and went under the sway of the tendency of this present age, following the prince of the power of the air, which is the devil. You were obedient under the control of the demon spirit that still constantly works in the sons of disobedience, the careless, rebellious, and the unbelieving, who go against the purposes of God. Among the, these, we as well as you live once lived and conduct ourselves in the passions of our flesh, our behavior governed by our corrupt and sensual nature, obeying the pulses of the flesh and the thoughts of the mind, our cravings dictated by our senses and our dark emanations, where we were then by nature children of God's rather than heirs of the nation like the rest of mankind. You were sinners, right? He's talking these divisions. You were sinners. I love this part. You read the Bible enough, you'll actually notice when, when any time it starts to get dirty, get dark, <coughs> there's always a but God moment, right? I love these but God moments or but grace moments. But God, you fell, but God, so rich in his mercy, because of it or to satisfy the great and wonderful intense love which he loved us, we were at our worst. And if you read, sometimes it depends on what Bible it says, relentless love, which means it never stops pursuing you. It is so hooked on you, man. It is stuck on you. That is God, right? He is, loves you so much. You've fallen, yet he loves you so much. To order to satisfy that great love he has for you, what did he do? Even when we're dead by our own shortcomings, time, he made us alive. One, you were never, you were not alive until you're made alive together in the fellowship and union with Christ. You actually walk around dead. But in Christ, you're alive. At your worst, God made you alive in Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself. I love that. Christ himself. You actually notice it says Jesus, a lot of the Bible it says Jesus himself. It could just simply say Jesus or Christ. It says himself. This is such a personal, isn't it so personal? Himself, Christ Himself, the new, same new life which He quickened Him or joined together in Him. For it is by grace that you are saved. He raised us up together with Him and made us sit down together, giving us joint seating with Him in the heavenly sphere by the virtue of, be, of our being in Christ Jesus. I said this before and I'll say it again. Adam was here in the garden, God was still up here, right? Adam fell, he fell much further. Now, and through redemption, right, it would just be simply just to put us back into the garden, right? Fair enough, right? You say, hey, put us there. But God didn't. God didn't put us back in the garden. He put us at his right hand up here, far above all principalities and powers, everything that can be ever renamed. He put us above everything. At his right hand. You're seated with Christ. It means you're not in the garden. You're high above the garden. Because Satan came into the garden. But Satan can't come to God's right hand. Which, which, which tells you what? In Christ you can't fall. Because Jesus represents you before everybody. You're far above it all. Redemption, man, do we get to see his love. It's like a, it's an overpayment for our sins. Because it would be, if it's just a pay, would put us back in the garden. He overpaid. It was so much more. His sacrifice is so much more than our sin. His grace is so much more than anything we could ever do in fall. Right? Let's keep going. He did this that he might clearly demonstrate through the ages to come. The ages to come. The next age. Not just this age, but eternity. His immeasurable. Riches of his free grace and his kindness and goodness of heart toward us in Christ Jesus. He wants to show us that magnificent love that he gave to us. That his richness, his immeasurable, means you can't, put, you can't put a rule to it. You can't measure it. I don't care how many rulers you have in this whole entire world on eternity. You can't measure it. It's immeasurable. I run seven miles. I can measure seven miles. But I can't measure his grace. It goes on and on and on. In the, in, in the Old Testament, it says his mercy endures forever. It's, it's actually in the Hebrew, his grace endures forever. Because it is immeasurable. It keeps on going. Jesus is grace. 
Got more for you. While we were yet in weakness, empowered us to help ourselves, at the fitting time, Christ died for the ungodly. I said this before, and, that's, and I'll say this again. I said it earlier this week. How do you know that God will always lead you to the right place at the right time? Because he put you in Christ. Christ died for you at the right time and the right place. He put you in his death, and he raised you up with him. So in your little things you have here on earth that you need, you're looking for a job, looking for anything, you can be sure that he will always place you at the right place at the right time to say the right things to the right person. Always. Because of what he did here. Now it's an extraordinary thing to get to thing for one to give his life even for an upright man. How many of y'all would die for somebody that you think is so great? I would raise my hand because you know I have a flesh. I'm just no different than any of y'all. My wife, somebody tried to shoot my wife, I'd jump from the bullet, right? I will save my wife and my children, my two little girls here. I will save them. You know what? We all will do that, right? Now, though perhaps for a noble and lovable and generous benefactor, someone might even dare to die. So somebody who's good, we might die. So uh, Pastor Monique, I might die for you. You know? And like, I might die for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're holy, right? So I might, you might be just great then. I might have to do that, right? Yeah, we all do that. We see it in the movies all the time, right? We see that. But God doesn't do that. <clears throat> but God, I told you again, these but God. But God shows and clearly proves. He shows and proves. We will never saw this show and prove the anime from the tree of life. Which I tell you is Jesus Christ and actually is the gospel. Because it says that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. I asked myself, why God, why not the plant of life? Why not the stone of life? Why not just a fruit of life? Why not, why tree of life? Because it says Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. It was the gospel right there in the garden for them to eat from. Because then it says, when after Adam fell and the law came later on, it says, curses everybody who hangs from a tree. Jesus died on a tree, which is two woods put together, which is actually a dead tree. And through the cross, we all have life. And it says in the book of Revelation, there's a tree of healing. In the, in the midst of Jerusalem, Jesus, the gospel is there. He's there. He clearly proves his own agape, unconditional love for us, by the fact, this one fact. I told you before, you don't know somebody truly loves you until you show them that how horrible a person you truly are. Right? My wife can tell you I'm probably disgusting. I can tell you right now, she's absolutely disgusting. She leaves the sink, the dish, the third dish is in the sink. She leaves the trash overflowing. And I had to clean it all, and I think it's absolutely disgusting. I love my wife with passion. And I see the dirtiness, the dirtiness of her. Yeah, I still love her. She's laughing. And I'm like, yes, thank you, babe. But you don't know somebody truly loves you until they see how horrible a person you really are. That's why anytime I, I marriage count newlyweds, I tell them. Take the veil off because you're going to see how dirty the person truly is. Because you're going to find stuff that can be, especially for women, you're going to find hair shavings in somewhere, some fashion in the bathroom, and it's going to drive you nuts. In my case, it's my wife's hair everywhere. So I get a dog and I, I look all holy and righteous with you guys. <laughs> but at your worst, so in this, by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That proves and shows love, God's love for you and I. For the fact that Adam fell, it came to our benefit that we get to see God's love. Thank you, Adam. I know that sounds crazy. How could somebody actually say thank you, Adam, when you see all the horrible destruction in the world, right? Right? But we get to see his love. I talked about the plane crash that happened earlier this week. That the co-pilot, they're saying that he actually downed the plane. They don't know all the facts. But I do know this one thing, which was actually quite beautiful that I saw. And it was on the major news network, so I say, hey, that's even better. A family, one of the American people who was on that plane who perished, their family spoke out. You would thought that they would say something horrible. They said, no. He said, you don't have to worry about praying for us. We know where our son is. He says, but we ask you to pray for the family of the pilot, the co-pilot. Because there's going to be things revealed about him that is going to be totally shocking to them. And it's, going to, and it's going to make them look at their son as if he's such a horrible person. Well, we want to pray for them. We want you all to come together and pray for them. Is that not love? This person just killed their son. 
Yeah, he's asking to pray for them. That's love. That took my attention. It was, it was even major the fact that he even hit a major news network for, for one. I was kind of surprised. Anyways, but in that, thank you, Adam. I can see God's love. You may be going through something right now that looks kind of horrible, or you're pretending that you're not going through something, but you actually truly are going through something that's horrible. You can actually say, I, I get to see God's love in us. Because you keep going. I just love reading. Therefore, since we are now justified, made acquitted, made righteous, not because you did anything great, because of what Jesus had done on the cross for you, and you believe in what he did, he took your place, it brought into right relationship with God. You didn't do it with your own works. You never could. Because if that was the case, Adam would have been brought right back up to the good works. Because if he, if he turned around and ate from the tree of life, it would be say it was his good works. But God in the garden told him before, he told him about what sin was going to do. He says to the snake, her seed will crush your head, but you will only bruise it. He already told him, man, Adam, I'm going to redeem you. And he did suck her in with all the stuff that was in there, right? The sin. But guess what? I call it a good Oreo cookie. You have the chocolate on the outside. I forget the vanilla cream. I like chocolate. Chocolate cookie on the outside. You get the little vanilla cream in the middle. Then you had chocolate at the bottom, right? He didn't finish up with the chocolate at the bottom, right? He said then he clothed Adam and Eve when he escorted them out. He clothed them. Which what? He made the sacrifice to clothe them. He was telling them again, I'm going to redeem you. You can't do it, Adam, but I will. So let's get back. By Christ's blood, how much more certain is that we shall be saved from him from the indignation and wrath of God? You're saved. In Christ, you're saved from what? What happens at the end, right? The tribulation period. You're saved from it. Means what? God has you. He will snatch you out from it all, right? For if while we were enemies with enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. And it is much more, if you keep going through Romans 5, you will notice that there's much more. Anytime I talk about grace, it's much more than what Adam did. Certain, now that we are reconciled, that we shall be saved through his resurrection, resurrection life. Not only so, but we also rejoice, exalting glory in God in his love and perfection through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received and enjoyed our reconciliation. We can actually stand in the midst of trouble rejoicing about God's love. Instead of moping about what all the bad that we see, we can actually rejoice in it. Because we're going to see God's love. Because that's what we're destined for. Right? Let's keep going. I, got, I told you I like to read. And I'm so sorry. I know y'all y'all had to go back. But you know what? If y'all can just stay a little longer, it'd be awesome. It'd be awesome. John 3. It, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert on a pole, so must so it's necessary that son of man be lifted up. Do you know the story? Israel complained in the, in, the, in the wilderness after the law had came. Hence, I say after the law came because they murmured and complained before the law came and no one died. But when they murmured and complained this time, God had to lift his protection up because it was based on if you do good, Israel, then you'll get good. If you do bad, I had to lift my protection up. I had to allow whatever comes in and come and harm you. They complained. Snakes came in. Vipers came into the camp and bit the people. And the people complain, to save us, Moses. But Moses didn't turn to God and said, God, what do you want me to do? He says, take a bronze snake. I want bronze, melt it down, form a snake, and put it on a pole. And he says, anybody who looks upon it shall be healed, shall be saved. You ready for it? It's actually Jesus Christ on the cross being judged for you and I sins. So about them, I heal it, but their needing of healing, all they had to look at is Jesus Christ being paid for the punishment. Done deal, they were healed. So, as the serpent was lifted on the pole, so so my son of man. He had to fulfill the prophecy which was already made about him. Right? In order that everyone who believes in him, who cleaves to him, and trusts in him, relies on him, may not perish, but have eternal life and live forever. And this is the part. Number with Abraham, God said to him, I know that you love me, for you gave up your only son. Right? For God so greatly, so love, in, in English, in English word, so love. That means, man, if somebody so loves you, you better watch out. Because I, I read parables, parables, especially the prodigal son, which I call the prodigal father. The father so loved his son that he tackled him and said he kissed him passionately. All of the didn't have, Didn't care what his son had come to say. He already, he already saved him. Because the father filled the gap, not the son. 
God so loved the world, which what? We're all in the world, right? He so loved you. <clears throat> Dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And there ain't no if, buts about it. All you have to do is what? Believe. Not your work, just believe. <clears throat> and you shall not perish. So that means what? You're saved by grace once and forever, right? It's only by grace that keeps you. Because it, it, this would say, then you have to maintain it yourself and keep yourself righteous and holy and do things right. Sustain from this and that, so then therefore you'll be saved. It doesn't say that. It says that God will keep you. His grace keeps you. For God did not send the Son to the world in order to judge the world, but that the world might find salvation, salvation or wholeness. It means save. Wholeness means everything. You got, a little, you got a little money issues? Well, salvation says that you prosper. You got a little healing, little healing issues? He says you're whole, you're healed. You got a little peace issues, you're not comfortable, you're upset, you're hurt, you know, you just, you're not comfortable. He says you have peace. You, not just that you're saved, but you have everything in this life, but a new body, which that's to come, right? That is our hope, our glory, right? That. So, let's go to Romans 8. I love this part. If God, he loved us so much, like by Adam's fall, we get to see his love. You want to see how powerful it is? Not just to save you, but you know what? You can't do anything to separate you. Paul makes this beautiful declaration. Man, he's, I, I just picture him standing on top of the hill just decorating, but of course he's just writing for pen. Actually, he's not even writing it. He's speaking it to somebody who's actually writing. Paul wasn't a good writer himself. Actually, he wasn't a good speaker himself. When he spoke in front of people, he had issues. I have issues. I have a tongue that can't, is, not, is attached to the bottom of my mouth. I can't stick it out. I can't do the double R's in Spanish. My speech teachers hated me because I couldn't speak right. I got put in special classes when I was in elementary school. And then my mom said, you will not put him in that in middle school. He just hated me. But here I am preaching God's word. So I put Paul up here. Who shall ever separate us from Christ's love? Shall suffering, affliction, and tribulations, or calamity, or distress, or persecution, or hunger, or destitution, or peril, or sword? Even as written, for your sake, we are put to death all the day long. We are regarded and counted as sheep for the slaughter. The world's evil. Right? He's telling you right here, the world is absolutely evil. You're going to see all this perilous death and just, just total destruction all around us. Yet yeah, amid all these things, we are more than conquerors. Do you know what it means to be more than conqueror? Do you, you know what it means? It means that somebody else already conquered for you. You should receive the benefits of them already conquering for you. You get to live the life that he, gave, he, he accomplished for you. He did. You don't do any work. You just receive it. You walk into it. God guides you into all seeing and manifestation of what Jesus has died to give you. That's what it's about. And again, it's a passing victory through him who loved us. That's who we are in Christ. And Paul keeps going. For I am persuaded beyond doubt. Now he's being persuaded beyond anything, beyond doubt. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor first powers, nor things impending and threatening for things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul names 17 things that cannot separate us from love, from his love. You ready? In 1 Corinthians 13, there's 13 things that describe God's <coughs> love, or really it describes himself, right? 17 is a very great number in the Bible. You want to know why? It represents victory. Victory is spelled out here for you and I. There ain't nothing going to separate from it. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. You know what? You, you, you made the made mistake, but thank you. Thank you. Because you know what? I cannot be separated from God's love anymore. I have it. I'm going to hang on to it. You know what? It, actually, it has me. I, I can't hang on to it. It has me because I've fallen probably in the midst of some of those things, but it can't separate me. Right? If we go further up, I love this part. We are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor means in Christ, all things work together 
and are fitting to a plan for good. For bad? For good. To those who love God and are called according to his design purpose. I know the first person will actually come and say, and say, well, you know what? You've got to love God first, though. It's only for the people who love God and are called according to his plan, purpose, right? That's where they come out. Uh, I'm sorry, a prideful mind will come out and say, or religious mind, you want to say. He says, you got to love God first, and you got to be doing his will. Contrary. He says that we love God because he first loved us. If you're born again, you love God because you respond to his love for you. So you love him back. Ready for this? His will for everybody is to be what? In Christ. If you're in Christ, you're already part of his will. Done deal. And he says all things. All things mean what? The good and the bad. If you're going to miss the bad, God will turn to good. I know some of you say, well now, you know what? You're just going to tell people now and give them the license just to go out and do whatever they want to, right? No. If you know that somebody actually truly loves you, you actually want to do right by them. My wife loves me. I don't want to go out and go anywhere else. I want to come home to her. Forget the strip clubs. I'm coming home to my wife. I got the best strip show, by the way. But in, in that case, oh. being married. But it doesn't make me want to go out and do anything else. And I know some people say, and it's funny, it's usually people who are already saved who say that. And I, say, I say to them, when God showed you his love and what Jesus has done for you, and you were an unbeliever, what did you do? You turned away from your old past and you came to him and says, I believe in Jesus. So the same thing happens when you realize how much God loves you. It will make you turn away from that. It will make you turn away. So that means if we, we mess up, and guess what? You'll probably leave out of this room and mess up, or you could be messing up if you're thinking about somebody or something else you probably shouldn't be thinking about. God will turn to good. Because in his goodness, he leads you to repent. And I'm like, oh, repent. Ah. No, it means change of mind. It means to change your mind. Not stop what you're doing and turn back to him. It's his goodness, his love, his grace, his mercy, his kindness that leads us back. God will always just keep showing us good. And we turn to him. Now one day, he'll snatch the church away and he'll have to, his wrath will come upon the earth. Well, guess what? You're in Christ and you have nothing to worry about. Now worry about those seven year tribulation. You care less about that. You you're like, yeah, hey God, I'm gonna be with you. Cool. And then afterwards we're gonna come down together, you're gonna destroy enemies, and I just get to be with you. That's what it's all about, right? That's his love. So it doesn't matter. Everything's gonna turn to good. So you may be going through something that's crazy right now, you actually say, Oh my god, how it's gonna turn to good. You know, it's funny is that I spent most of my life, you know, 14 years of pornography addiction, man, that turned to all kinds of mess. But you know what? I can simply say, God turned for good with my wife. I got a woman pregnant when back in 2007, 2006, 2006. I got her pregnant, and she got an abortion. God turned to good. I had two beautiful daughters, and I got a son who's going to be coming one day. I already knew it. The name is you. It all turned out for good. I tried to commit suicide, not once, but twice. Once as not saved, and once as being saved. <coughs> we know how God turned out to good? I get to stand here and pastor people and lead them to Jesus Christ. I get to give them life, show them life. God turns everything for good. It's funny because I can tell you, me and my wife have some, sometimes the most strongest arguments, disagreements, but you know what happens afterwards? Our marriage all of a sudden just turns good. And we come so much closer together. I do that with my friend, friends too, it doesn't matter. I can tell you for my kids, especially my old, my two year old, oh man, she's in that phase. She drives me absolutely nuts. Because she's always begging or whining about something. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna pull my hair out, which I don't have any hair on my head. <laughs> but I I hey, I fall and I fuss and I chew her out and I'm like, stop it, Grace. You know what's funny about that? It happened one time. And it made me cry because she didn't want to come towards me. And I cried. And all of a sudden, she came over and just hugged me. And started just telling me her, her life story, I guess. It was just blah, 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 blah. blah. She, it was just in <laughs> tongues. But she just started and, and, and pulled me into the living room and wanted to watch TV with me. God turned that bad situation just with me and my daughter to good. And you know what? You guys, my wife, she's a daddy's girl. 
And that, my wife and dad is probably a dad's girl too now. I'm a sucker for my girls. But he'll turn to good. For those whom he foreknew, who in Christ he foreknew, of whom he was aware in love beforehand. God loved you before he even created you. Before he created anything, he loved you. And how did he do that? He already put the plan of redemption in place. It was already in place. It said that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. He already knew you were going to fall. He already knew Adam was going to make the wrong choice. He already knew. He said, Jesus, Jesus be, or light be in Genesis, right? He also destined from the beginning for them to be molded into the image of his son, Jesus. He knew that you were going to take on Adam's image, but he was going to fix it and turn you back into his son's image, who he pride, is his pride and joy. And share in, in his likeness, that he might become the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he first formed, then he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. Which means what? You've been acquitted of all your, all your past, present, and future sins. Done. Deal. It's all on the cross. And Colossians 2.13 says that God on the cross forgave you of all his sins. Which means what? It's a, it's a great, I, I love to study Hebrew and Greek. Hebrew and Greek. If I can speak right. Hebrew and Greek. And, and that in the Greek is it's a perfect present tense. It means what? It means that it stands, it's once and done forever, never to be repeated. It stands forever. It's just like when Jesus cried out, it is finished, or finished in the Greek. It means once done, never to be repeated. It stands forever. Done deal. It means that your sins were paid for. Done. It can never come back on you. And if God did, y'all know about the rule of double jeopardy? <coughs> Can't do it. Can't be tried twice for the same crime. Can't. It's already been tried on Jesus. God can't try on you. So knowing all that, knowing that God loves you so much, he's turned into good, he justified you, he made you all this, and those he justified, he also glorified. He brought you back up. His good opinion now covers you. It means that God smiles at you. It makes you feel good when someone's smiling at you. Yeah, anybody watch Joel Osteen? The man's forever smiling. I can't help but to smile when I look at the man, right? He smiles. So God smiles at you. His good opinion is covered all over you. You had weight before him. For all that being said, I love what Paul says, what then shall we say to all of this? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Who can be our foe if God is on our side? Flip that around. I, I looked at this. God just, man, he just will tweak stuff around allow you to see because he just loves showing sun. He's telling you, Hey, he can only be the one who's against you. But because he's for you, there is nothing that can ever stand before you. Yet you are at his right hand above everything. It means that nothing can stand before you but God. And he's for you. Done deal. And he who did not withhold or spare even his own son, God gave up Jesus, but gave him up for us all, he will not, will he not also freely and graciously give us all our things? Guess what? You have so many things you need in your life, right? Because he gave up his son, he will freely give you everything. Because if he held anything back from you, what does that tell you? That he holds it more high esteem above Jesus. But because he gave up Jesus, he'll give you that too. And with Jesus, he actually given you everything. He made you heir to the world, which means what? This whole place is yours. Now, don't go out there and start saying, this is my curtain, this is my door, this is my bus. And I know when y'all get back on the bus, someone says, this is my bus. Well, let's be real, but you get to use it, right? Right? You need healing, he's your healer. <coughs> or your help. He says, I am. I am whatever you need me to be. And we can be sure of those. So when we, I, I know, it's strange to think about this and say, <coughs> thank you. You, you make a mistake and you start seeing this, this craziness that happened before you, you can actually say, thank you, God, because I'm going to see your love. I'm going to see you turn this all around for good. You know what? We always want to prove our haters wrong, right? Stop trying to go out there and do it yourself. Allow God to do it. God will turn your bad situation around and rise up. There's so many people who walk the life that happened to I, I like to study people. Smith Wigglesworth, if anyone knows who he was, he was a big evangelist in England. You know, he used to beat his wife. He, was a, he beat his wife almost every day and treat her like crap. 
So much that one day she left to go to Bible study. He locked the door and locked her outside, locked her out of the house. Next morning when he came out, he unlocked the door and she slept right there by his door. Soon as she got up, she got up and went into the kitchen and started cooking, making breakfast. He goes, she goes, what would you like for breakfast, honey? And he sat there at the table and says, what in the world? <coughs> that same day, he, he got saved. And he became one of the biggest evangelists in all of England. He raised more people from the dead than anybody else has ever had in history besides Jesus. He used to go to funerals, purposely on funerals, and people out of, out of, the, out of the casket and says, rise up in the name of Jesus, and they will walk and be living. So much funeral director, directors probably didn't like him so much. They actually banned him from cemeteries and certain places and stuff. But he was bringing people back from the dead. From a man who beat his wife to being one of the biggest proclaimers of Jesus Christ in, in all of England and in most of the world at the time. So you may be looking.